Hi everyone, my name is Susanna, um, and today I want to start out by asking you to envision yourself at the beach watching the waves crash onto the seashore. And as you're envisioning this and you're seeing the waves come in and go out, I want to suggest to you that the history of feminism is a lot like waves. Um, and what I mean by that is that there's really no definitive beginning and there's really no definitive end, but rather feminism has kind of gained momentum um, at certain periods and then kind of ebbed um, and lost its momentum a little bit. So today I want to focus on the three uh, main waves of feminism that are identified. Um, and so the first wave began in the 19th and 20th centuries, um, and this really focused uh, mainly in the beginning on the suffrage movements, um, and a lot of the women were involved in that, and they were also involved in the abolitionist movement. Um, so one of the first um, official like, meetings was uh, the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848, where 300 uh, men and women met to discuss kind of the ideologies of their movement and what they believed and why they believed it. Um, and then moving on, that momentum kind of continued uh, up until World War II, um, and that's obviously, as I'm assuming most of you know, um, a lot of men went off to war, and so women took their places in the workforce um, in factory jobs and working production jobs, and then when the men came back after the war, a lot of them were either um, fired, actually most of them were fired, or they were just kind of discouraged um, to continue to work. So I want to show you two images. The first, how many of you guys are familiar with this image? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a really famous image, um, and this kind of represents the whole the whole thinking during that time. It's very, very we can do it, um, um, and they wanted to encourage women in the workforce. And then this is an image that kind of represents um, what it became when the men came back. And so it's, of course I can in response to that photo, but it's, of course I can be a housewife, take care of the kids, put dinner on the table, and look great while doing it. Um, <laughs> that's really what they promoted after that. And a lot of um, media campaigns had a lot to do with that as well. And then moving on to the second wave, this started during the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Um, and this was very characterized by uh, reproductive rights, as I say here, um, fighting against gender discrimination in the workplace. And this means the type of jobs women were offered, and also the, the pay gap that kind of existed then and still exists to this day. Um, and a lot of feminists involved in this movement were also very anti-war, very involved in that movement, and also very involved in the civil rights movement. So they were very related. And the great thing about this second wave was that it was much more inclusive of the type of people that were a part of it. So it wasn't just you know your female, white, middle class, um, Western woman. It was women of all races, men of all races, and classes, and ages, and sexual orientations. Um, so that really characterized the second <coughs> wave as well. And then this image that I'm going to show you is um, this. Mm. Um, was uh, protesting the 1968 Miss America pageant that took place at Atlantic City. And as you can see, the protesters were likening the pageant to a cattle auction. Mm. Um, and so they had very vivid um, things of that. And then moving on to the third wave, this began um, around the 90s, and a lot of people would say it's kind of continued up until the present day. And this wave of feminism is very um, influenced by a post-colonial view of the world and postmodern view of the world, and it's really um, has a very dominant idea of intersectionality. And basically what that means, it's, it's kind of the idea that your gender is a big part of who you are, and it's a big part of the way you see the world. That's not the only thing that you see the world through. So an example of this would be if you were a black lesbian woman and you were being discriminated against, it could be because of your gender, but it could also be because of your race, and it could also be because of your sexual orientation. So it's kind of the inclusion of many types of ways that people are oppressed and kind of understanding that. Um, and it also has um, a big focus on, and this is a very post-colonial view, of um, hearing from people from different places and who have different voices um, and different opinions um, and just come from different backgrounds. Um, so as I say here, it's not just the white Western middle class heterosexual male that we hear a lot from um, today. And so I wanted to, oh yeah, critique of feminism's ways. So, the first wave was kind of critiqued because it mainly targeted um, the women's right to vote, and then even moving on, it was still the exact same type of woman involved in the movement. And then the second wave, um, as it says here, was so for women in the workplace that it kind of tended to look down on the women that did want to stay at home and wanted to be mothers and wanted to be housewives. Um, and both of these waves didn't really do a great job on connecting with ideas other than gender and sometimes race. Um, so I want to play for you a brief clip 
of um, a speaker. Her name is Chimamanda Adichie. She is um, a Nigerian author. Um, and I want to play a brief. Ask the Nigerians of what she says. This is a TED talk she gave on feminism. Familiar with how quick, how quick are people at to give unsolicited advice? So I decided to call myself a happy feminist. Then an academic Nigerian woman told me that feminism was not our culture. The feminism was in Africa. And that I was calling myself a feminist because I had been corrupted by Western books. Which amused me because, <clears throat> and each time I tried to read those books called feminist classics, I get bored. And I really struggle to finish them. But anyway, since feminism was on Africa, I decided I would now call myself a happy African feminist. At some point, I was a happy African feminist who does not hate men and who likes lip gloss and who wears high heels for herself but not for men. <laughs> of course, a lot of this was tongue in cheek, but that word feminist is so heavy with baggage, negative baggage. You hate men, you hate bras, you hate African culture, that sort of thing. Uh, I wanted to share that because in this, in that segment, she's kind of being a bit sarcastic about the way feminists are viewed. But um, she also brings up a lot of stereotypes that I think are really prevalent um, concerning feminists, feminists um, the idea that they hate men, they don't wear browsers or that. Um, and I wanted to also share this because I think Chimamanda is a good example of what feminists today really look like. You know, they're not white necessarily, they're not necessarily from a Western um, country. So I wanted to share that um, with you. And this also kind of shows that feminism today is not only a, a Western movement and it's not only a white woman's movement. So I wanted to show you guys that clip. And then to conclude, um, I just want to briefly recap. Obviously, each wave was kind of built upon the idea that there were flaws with the previous wave. And so each one kind of tried to build upon the failures of the last wave. And where we are currently today, um, a lot of people still think that there's a lot that could be improved upon. Um, and a lot of, I think, feminism today is really trying to work towards a world where we're hearing from many different and many varied voices in terms of politics, in terms of media, and in terms of the workplace. And so I think if you're looking to the future, I think that's where the future of feminism is really heading. So thank you. Thank you for your time.